The so-called special part of the model penal code proposes a long list of carefully reformulated specific offenses. Mostly, we are concerned only with the general interpretive provisions of the model penal code and not with its effort to redefine a host of familiar personal and property offenses. Here, we make an exception for the homicide offenses. The model penal code abandons key items of language with which the states of the United States had defined the homicide offenses. The first thing to go into the rubbish bin was the term malice aforethought. The model penal code definition of murder does without it. Under the code, Criminal homicide constitutes murder when it is committed purposely or knowingly or recklessly under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. This definition is meant to capture the same range of homicidal acts as the traditional malice of forethought formula, but to do so making use of clearly defined concepts, or at least more clearly defined. So, malice of forethought is out. Out also is the distinction between degrees of murder. The distinction between murder and manslaughter is retained, as we shall see. The reason the premeditation formula is junked should be fairly clear from our discussion of the cases that try to apply it. It doesn't draw the line where it ought to. As the drafters observe, Premeditation is not a reliable sign that a homicide belongs among the more heinous. Prior reflection may reveal the uncertainties of a tortured conscience rather than exceptional depravity. Think of the case of the son deciding to ease his terminally ill, pain-racked father into a better world. The suddenness of killing may simply reveal callousness so complete and depravity so extreme that no hesitation is required. What the model penal code would have the states do can be visualized in this way. From the model penal code perspective, degrees of depravity matter, but premeditation doesn't mark those degrees accurately. Rather than try to draw the line another way, the model penal code simply does away with it, and makes premeditation a sentencing factor for the sentencer to weigh in deciding upon a punishment. Depending on the wider set of facts which the sentencer is allowed to weigh, premeditation might aggravate or mitigate the seriousness of the offense. Our focus is on the definition of the offense at the guilt or innocence phase of the criminal process. We do not explore the sentencing phase in any detail. We do note that the effect of distinguishing degrees of an offense serves typically to narrow the range of discretion the sentencer is called upon to exercise. For example, where a statute distinguishes first and second degrees of an offense, it does so with reference to the presence or absence of some factor such as premeditation or use of a weapon. A longer term of imprisonment is then associated with the first degree offense. In this example, the second degree offense gets you one to five years and the first degree from five to 20. If you do away with that distinction, you have to decide what to do about the sentencing range. You might make it one to 20 which gives the sentencer considerably wider discretion. And the distinguishing factor of the graver offense becomes a mere sentencing factor. These are issues the legislatures have to deal with primarily. What to punish, how severely to punish, whether to divide an offense into degrees, and how to draw the line between degrees. Not easy tasks. But these are not our tasks. Our task is only to understand how to determine what it is that a statute says is punishable.